Hi everyone, and welcome to the third webinar of IULM Flow Masterclass series. I am Alberto Zanetti, and I am International Recruitment Officer at IULM University in Milan. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for this session, for this webinar. Today's masterclass is from video game to game videos, held by Professor Matteo Bicarini. The masterclass will take you to an overview of one of the most trending topics in today, today's communication studies, that is the streaming of gaming content for the purpose of communication and entertainment. Before introducing our keynote speaker for this masterclass, I just want to give you a few information concerning the idea which stands behind this masterclass series. These webinars are meant to give you a sneak peek of what it's like to be a student at IOLM University with a special focus on our bachelor's program in corporate communication and public relations that is entirely held in English. Now, I believe I've spoken pretty much for the time being, so I don't want to bother you with a long introduction, and I'm ready to give the floor to Professor Matteo Dutanti, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Communication at IOLM University, and coordinator of our one-year master program in game design. I will be following the massive glass in the background and taking notes of your questions. And I will see you after the masterclass with a short introduction on how to become a member of IULM World. Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alberto, and thank you, Lorenzo, for making this possible. Uh, you should be um, seeing my presentation on the screen, so I'm gonna switch to that. Thank you. <clears throat> So um, today I wanted to talk about game videos, um, which is a very interesting topic because for a very long time, uh, video games were um, kind of like the new thing, right? But in the past, I would say decade, um, with the rising of uh, platforms like uh, uh, Twitch, um, YouTube uh, videos and many others, uh, Mixer for a while, um, a different kind of, uh, of game culture started to emerge. But today I'm actually gonna focus on another um, specific um, aspect of this culture, the one that uh, Yule University has contributed significantly in the past 10 years. I wanted to, first of all, clarify some key terms so that we are all on the same page um, and we share the same vocabulary. Um, there's one thing called game studies, and this is an academic discipline that investigates what video games are, what video games do um, on a variety of level, how they work as texts, but also as context, uh, also the pretest, why, why do people play games, right? And Yulm University has always been one of the most um, uh, prominent universities in Italy for this kind of work. Uh, we hosted the very first uh, um, DIGRA, uh, Italian DIGRA in 2017. Um, sorry, we hosted the first Italian uh, DIGRA. Um, it's, it's a conference about game studies. Um, the DIGRA conference started in 2004 for the first time, very first time. Uh, Yulm University hosted the very first edition, and you can see Cindy Poremba from Canada giving the keynote. Um, we also have a series of events related to every aspect of gaming, from communication to marketing to performing to gender. Um, we do all sorts of events to try to uh, deconstruct uh, the nature of gaming. Uh, this one was about, for example, the representation of gender within video games. There's another thing called game design, as you know, obviously, which is about the development and creation of video games. And once again, Yulm University is the first university in, uh, in Italy to offer a fully-fledged uh, Master of Arts in Game Design 
and we do make games. Uh, we do develop games. Uh, um, some of these games um, get to be published and shared and sold internationally. The students have 100% of copyright uh, property of their productions. They don't have to share with the school or anything. And we work in this space, this beautiful sp space. It's, it's, a, it's kind of like a farm. Um, it's part of the Yum campus and we do uh, create uh, we work um, in in this space um, collegially with, um, with with professors that come from all over the world. And this year, for the first time, we are offering the program entirely online because of COVID. Hopefully, this is temporary, but uh, this is what it is. <laughs> and last but not least, um, there's another thing called uh, video game based art, which is the thing that I am personally most passionate about. And this is something that once again, Yulm University has been um, spearheading for the past uh, for the past five years, at least I would say. Um, we've organized a series of exhibitions and events that use video games in unintended um, ways, um, and we show the kind of art that you can uh, create by using video games, um, video game engines, video game assets, all sort of things that uh, are not necessarily games, are not necessarily interactive, but they are nonetheless part of game culture. And this is an exhibition that um, we organize at Yulm with the students. They work for us for like three months and we um, invited um, dozens of artists from all over the world to present their work at Yulm. Um, this was part of an international exhibition uh, organized by uh, the Trinale Museum in Milan, which is the most important museum for design. And game design is part definitely of, of design, right? Um, so we invited 37 artists from 14 different countries all over the world. Um, uh, 30 were male, seven were female. Um, the youngest was 19, the oldest was Arun Faraki, was 70, who just died by the way. Uh, but this also showed the variety of, of, of um, uh, personalities working with games. Um, and the students also did um, a series of interviews with all these artists and we uh, shared them online, we shared them in the exhibition space. And the idea was really to engage with the city of Milan and bring machinima, which is the topic that I'm gonna address uh, mostly today, um, with people who didn't even know that you could do these sort of things with video games. Because there's like this sort of like um, stereotype about gaming being, you know, very, very kind of like a violent entertainment, kind of meaningless, uh, uh, just a form of escapism. But um, by inviting all these artists and sharing their work, we wanted to demonstrate that video games can also be something else, in this case, a form of art. Um, and this is the team, the team that work at the exhibition, the young students. The exhibition was co-curated by um, Professor Vincenzo Trione and myself. Um, and these were the students of the Art, Heritage and Culture and Market, sorry, um, uh, Bachelor of, of Arts. Um, and we kept doing it because we really like the kind of environment. We love working with students and engage them in this kind of activities. And so, um, for the past four years, we uh, organized on, a, on an annual basis uh, the Milan Machinima Festival, which is a festival that showcases the very best machinima production um, from all over the world. And I'm gonna get back to this weird world uh, machinima in a second. And so there's this thing called video games, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but the game videos phenomenon is relatively recent. And it has to do with a variety of spectatorial um, practices related to video games. So that is watching video games, watching people video games, rather than playing video games themselves. This, by the way, is a huge market um, based on a study by New Zoo in 2018. The entire market for game videos um, is bigger than um, virtual reality and uh, augmented reality combined. 
uh, that was worth $6.5 billion in 2018. I don't have um, newer data, but that's a pretty staggering amount of, of money. But machine learning is a different side because it's less related to the market and more to the, uh, more to the R world. Uh, what do we mean by, by, by the term machinima? Well, machinima is basically defined usually conventionally as the use of real-time computer graphics engines to create a cinematic production. In other words, it's about using video games and video games technology to make something that is not a video game, but is actually similar to a film, to a TV production, to a video. Um, a definition that I perfectly that I uh, definition that I, I personally prefer is this one. I, I consider machinima a form of video art that appropriates and recontextualizes the source material, in this case, video games. And so when I talk about machinima, um, I am basically talking about something that is located, that is situated between contemporary art and video games. So it's kind of like a niche. And it's a hybrid. It's, it's kind of like something that is in between different things. Um, but probably the, the simplest definition that I can give of machinima is a video game without a game. So it's a game video. There's no interactivity. This is basically more about storytelling. This is about creating a narrative. Um, instead of changing, interacting uh, through uh, a controller to an interface, right? Now, when we talk about machinima, um, we're talking about something that is extremely vast, extremely big. Um, and machinima concerns both, both fandom and contemporary art. Um, by fandom, I mean uh, user-generated content by gamers and players because today making machinima is extremely simple. In fact, um, consoles have a share button. You can start streaming and recording um, gameplay as you play. Uh, back in the day, it used to be very cumbersome, but now it's super easy. And there's also contemporary art where the production is not meant to be shared online, for example, on YouTube, but on different kind of contexts like museums, uh, galleries, for a different kind of audience. And so when we talk about fandom, we're really talking about the vernacular. We're really talking about YouTube. We're really talking about sharing stuff on, on a PlayStation, making GIFs, um, and sharing on, on Instagram of other tools. But when we talk about machinimized contemporary art, um, we're really dealing with the avant-garde. I, I consider machinima a form of avant-garde that uses video games as its main aesthetics. So just to put things in perspective, I would say that, that the vernacular is this big. This is the, the amount of production that is related to machinima is mostly fandom. It's mostly uh, made by fans who don't care or don't have any artistic ambition. And then there's a smaller minority of people doing more avant-garde production that are meant for a different kind of uh, audience. And uh, this is where I, I'm, 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 I'm interested in both, but the kind of work that we do at Yulm, for example, is a little bit more on the um, avant-garde um, dimension. But what's interesting is that if we look at both the vernacular production and the contemporary production, both the fandom and the avant-garde, Making machinima is not really that different because both practices require the appropriation and transformation of copyrighted material, that is video games, for purposes that are other than fun, entertainment. Um, and so it's basically, as you can see, using things that other people have done. So game designers create games, but then you take that game and you do other things with it. So it's kind of like a gray area, as you can tell, because you're basically dealing with IP that is intellectual property that is not yours. Um, so we will see now what is the relationship between creators and companies. But just that keep in mind that making machinima doesn't change on the context. It's the practice is always the same, very similar. So if we talk about the machinima 
as avant-garde, as uh, kind of like video art. as I personally, um, it is video games and it's between also experimental cinema. So Machinima is weird, right? Because it's many different things at the same time and none of them. It's a brand new thing, even though it's been around for a, um, quite, a, quite some time as we will see. As a matter of fact, Machinima has a long history. Um, it's been around for, depending on who you listen to, um, 40 years or 20 years, there are like, there's no one single inventor. There are many different explanations for what Machinima is, where it came from and where it's going. Um, there's a school of thought that believes that Machinima was invented in the eighties with the rise of the demo scene. Uh, that is, um, you know, pirates and crackers and hackers making intros for uh, games that they would uh, pirate for the very early computer, um, the Commodore 64, the, uh, the Commodore Amiga, the Atari ST. Uh, they would crack the games in order to share them on bulletin boards and other on the precursor of the internet. Uh, this is the 80s, so it's before the World Wide Web as we know it today. Um, and they would make these very intricate and elaborate demos using um, computer programs and assets, not necessarily the game technology itself. So that's why I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical in considering the demo scene part of the machinima history. However, some scholars include that. There's another school of thought that um, cites and quotes Stunt Island, a very early game by Disney Interactive made in 1992 um, that allow people to fly planes and, but the real, the, the, the real interesting thing about this game was not really flying this plane and doing like stunts in the air, but it was really like making short videos with this technology. So you would make videos and people started doing that and sharing their videos on AOL, which is again, the precursor of the internet it was like an um, American online. Um, and Michael Nietzsche was a researcher at Georgia uh, Tech, wrote a really interesting book about um, machinima as coming from that culture. And people started making stories and sharing the stories. And, and, and um, uh, so for them, playing the game was not really doing the stunts, playing the game as was intended, but making these little short videos, which were, by the way, already embedded within the game itself. So they, they weren't using any specific tools or any like um, additional elements. Uh, that was for them uh, the game. That was for them the real fun, right? And that's another story. But the canonical story is the one that uh, um, sees the rise of Machinima with the introduction of Doom and Quake, therefore um, first person shooters. Um, and uh, this is a story that is basically usually told by Henry Lowood from Stanford University, one of the scholars that has written um, significant amount of literature, really good contribution on machinima. And he talks about the fact that um, machinima was invented for two purposes. And the first one was really about validating the performances of the players. So they would do speed runs. Um, so people would play the game really, really quick in order to finish the game as soon as possible without dying. And that genre of play is called speedrun. Um, and uh, it started like around that, that time in the early 90s. And it's still a big thing in gaming. Uh, there are people that play games in order to finish them as quick as possible um, for games that do not necessarily, they're not time-based, right? So for example, platform games, there's an entire like speedrun community around uh, Super Mario. There are people finishing Super Mario, like um, Super Mario Bros. in like three minutes or something, and they compete with each other. It's fascinating. And so they would record their performance with a video in order to document and certify their performance. But other people started using Doom, and especially Quake, to make, again, short stories. And this is called Quake movies. And this is also the precursor of Machinima in the, in the sense that they weren't really about um, training and improving their skills, but it was really telling stories. So they would use a game that is really violent. It's, it's got no narrative pretty much like Quake. It's people meeting and playing multiplayer shooting games 
in a in space in this virtual base or whatever that is um, that that was doing more than Quake. But anyway, uh, a story with a game without a story was used to make stories and usually funny stories like. Um, uh, with the very first machine, I might consider like the this um, Diary of a Camper by United Rangers, uh, which is a story about this uh, these players that kill this camper, and camper is um, uh, slang for a player that instead of shooting and going after the other players, uh, is hiding somewhere and you know uh, shooting the other players, and it's considered to be like lame, a loser, loser. So these players go kill him, and they discover that. The camper in question is and nonetheless than um, John Romero, the co-designer uh, of the game. And so and it, another interesting thing about the Quake movies is that this is before MP4, for example, other formats. So in, in order to see these movies, to watch these movies, you, uh, you had to have Quake or Doom. You had to have these games installed. So you would share this, these demo files and watch these films. Um, but an entire subculture started started like um, uh, growing and emerging from the Quake movie scene, and as Henry Lowood writes, uh, uh, these movies became a context for spectatorship, and the result was nothing less than a metamorphosis of the player into a performer. So the idea that you started like performing within the game, not just to like do the things you're supposed to do, shooting, killing, etc but you became a true actor. So you will use the sets and props of the video game to make a little movie, to, make a, to, make a, to tell a story. In this case, um, the United Rangers made a lot of uh, comedies, which is ironic considering that this game was ultra violent and super like you know, um, gory and brutal. So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, you know, it's, there's a form of subversion. Other scholars call this kind of uh, gaming like emergent gameplay. So that is a form of play, a form of engaging with the text that is not really um, expected by the designers, but it's there, it's possible. Um, it's what people started doing uh, because the game affords this kind of behaviors, this kind of activities. And so you create an entire film culture base uh, around the game that has no real issue whatsoever with um, uh, storytelling and filmmaking as we know it. <clears throat> so around 2000, that is 20 years ago, holy cow, 20 years ago, um, the very word machinima was introduced by these two guys, um, Hugh Hancock, which was a filmmaker and an artist from Scotland and Paul Marino from the United States. Hugh Hancock fortunately died a couple of years ago. He was super young. And Paul Marino was also, and back then they, they, they discovered this genre, they started doing things together. And they came up with an entire theory based on this emerging field. And by the way, machinima is a mistake. It was, um, it was it's, 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 it's a misspelling of machinima, because the idea was that this um, uh, neologist, this, this portmanteau of machine cinema or machine animation. So. It was intended as machinima, but they, you know, it's one of those things like, I don't know, Donkey Kong, that was supposed to be Monkey Kong, but they made a mistake. So uh, it remained Donkey Kong. Machinima, the same thing, right? Um, and now we were stuck with this, with this term, which is totally fine, by the way. And so all of a sudden, um, a bunch of new games came along and they, become, they became more and more sophisticated and powerful. And a lot of people started using these things to make, to tell stories. Um, and and uh, Rooster Thief, for example, uh, created this very popular sitcom. It was a series based on Halo, the um, Microsoft first person shooter that was launched with the Xbox in 2001, for example. And they, they did like, I don't know, hundreds of episodes. They even started selling DVDs of this um, ironic series where there are two soldiers basically talking to each other and why they're fighting, what's the point? It was very existential, but also kind of funny uh, in a very light, light, lighthearted way. And this is interesting because uh, Red versus Blue made Mashima popular. It became a, a piece of popular culture like nothing else before in, within this film. And also, is one of the few machinima that was able to that 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 was actually sold 
uh, these creators made a profit by using assets developed and created by Microsoft. So that was very controversial at that time. Um, and it's still controversial at the time. There's always ongoing like, so for example, Twitch last week decided that you can use um, copyrighted music in your stream. So it's removing streams, et cetera. Every once in a while, a company would um, suit, a publisher would suit like a streamer for using their content. Nintendo is particularly reluctant to having people using their content for doing things. Online streaming, making videos, et cetera. But uh, Microsoft actually was extremely tolerant and really actually supportive, supportive of this community. They also saw that Machinima, in this case, as fandom, was the best kind of um, um, marketing that somebody could do uh, because they show that, and again, a super violent first-person shooter could actually be used for telling stories, for making comedy. So it was kind of like revolutionary back in the day. And he also did series with um, The Sims and other games, but this Red versus Blue remains the most uh, pop popular um, Machinima series of all time, I would say. And for a while, Machinima seemed like um, unstoppable. And Machinima.com was introduced um, in uh, 2000. Uh, again, uh, Hugh Hancock sold the, um, the intellectual property of this company. And they launched something like, I would say, the MTV of gamers back in the day. Um, they, seem, they didn't simply start showing. At first, they were showing Machinima, the equivalent of music videos for gamers. But then they started making, like MTV did later on, um, shows about games and about game culture, which also predated the rise of um, live streaming on YouTube and Twitch. And so it was basically an entertainment channel. And um, they had billions of Machinima viewed. But little by little, they, they changed and they even dropped. Like, 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 like MTV stopped showing music videos at one point. Uh, similarly, uh, Machinima stopped making showing Machinima, and they started just like it was just about entertainment and game culture and uh, and streaming. Um, meanwhile, uh, other companies saw an, a great potential in Machinima as a form of storytelling, as a marketing tool. Uh, probably the most supportive of this community were um, Rockstar Games, which introduced uh, the Rockstar Editor, uh, the follow-up, the successor of Replay, which was a function in previous games. And the Rockstar Editor is pretty much like an editing tool, very powerful, very sophisticated, very advanced, that was introduced with um, uh, Grand Theft Auto V back in 2013. And by the way, Rock, uh, Grand Theft Auto V is still one of the best-selling game. Um, it's by, I don't know if you know, but it's the most uh, successful entertainment product of all time in terms of revenues, in terms of popularity, well beyond, uh, any film you can think of, including the Avengers, which is the most watched film of all time, uh, box office wise. And so an entire culture of gamers making films, machinima videos with the Rockstar Radio was born and if you if you if you look for um, Grand Theft Auto on YouTube, for example, you would find literally, literally billions of videos made by players who would use the game as their set, as their cinematic set and the props, and we make stories and then edit it together and and, and include um, um, I don't know subtitles, special effects, filters, and it became more and more sophisticated as it uh, went along. The Sims, as I mentioned before, which is another of the most popular you know, franchises of all time, um, it was launched by Electronic Arts in 2000. The original game was developed by uh, Will Wright, probably one of the greatest game designers of all time. And um, again, um, The Sims was used to tell stories more than actually to simulate, um, I don't know, social relations within this uh, virtual space. Um, and um, like, like Grand Theft Auto, it has a very robust, powerful, flexible um, movie editing tool. And this is another, this is for example, an extra content for um, The Sims 4. It's called Get Famous, which was introduced in uh, 2018. And again, it's very similar to a previous game made um, uh, early on in the zeros called The Movies, where you can actually shoot the movie and become a film director within a video game and compete for 
uh, fame and distribution within the game space. But also, there's a, there are a lot of people making incredible films, incredible machinima with the scenes as of this, as of today. Um, so as you can see, the, uh, the game industry is very supportive of machinima. And um, very recently, uh, NVIDIA introduced a new generation of a very powerful um, graphic cards, the GPUs, uh, the RTX uh, 3000 series. And they launched this new tool, which is the Omniverse Machinima, which is an incredibly powerful um, platform that allows you to remix, recreate, and redefine video game storytelling. So you can see how the biggest player in the gaming industry, including Rockstar Games, including Electronic Arts, but even like uh, hardware uh, manufacturers like NVIDIA are actively supporting Machinima with the very best technology and tools um, in, in, in the trade. <clears throat> However, <laughs> There's a but. Um, everything that I've told you so far is very interesting. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I mean, I'm in love with this. I play games um, myself. Uh, and um, But this approach is very game-centric and very uh, tech-centric. You know what I mean? I mean, this is, we're still talking about game content produced by gamers for other gamers. Okay, so it's great, but it's within a bubble. It's within a subculture. Now, I mentioned before that there's another side that is much smaller, let's face it, way, 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 way smaller than the fandom and the vernacular related to machinima. However, I find it extremely uh, creative and fascinating, and this is where we have sort of like, um, this is the field that we explored in the past uh, five to 10 years at Yule University, for example. And so if I had to pick the beginning of Machinima for me, it wouldn't be the demo scene, it wouldn't be Stunt um, Island, like Michael Nietzsche su suggests, uh, or Doom or Quake, as uh, Henry Lowe would um, suggest, but, to me, Machinima starts with Miltus Manetas, this Greek artist who studied in Italy, lived in the US for a long time, London, um, I think he's now living in South America. And I find him incredibly um, remarkable because his entire artistic practice is about understanding the role that technology plays in our lives and reinterpreting it through different media, including video games, or actually machinima. So to me, the history of machinima starts with this thing. What is it? This is a fly simulator for the Macintosh, very old one, F-18 Hornet. And so one day, Mike, uh, Miltus Maneta is uh, at a friend's place and the friend is playing um, this game on the Apple II and he's fascinated with this game, but he's not fascinated with the game itself, but with the fact that this game has a bug. So the plane is flying in the sky, but at one point he's try he tries Miltus to crash the plane into the ocean and the plane doesn't crash. In fact, it starts bouncing, boing, boing, boing. And so he's so fascinated by this, this glitch, this, this not a glitch actually, this, this bug, right? They didn't program the crashing sequence. So the plane floats and bounces as it reaches the ocean. And so he decides to make a film, to make a movie. And this is the movie, um, this is not a movie, this is still from a movie, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Yeah, this is better. This is how we showed at Yule University in 2016. And it's really simple, it's really clean. He just appropriated the video and he decided that this game was art, okay? So the artistic gesture here is about appropriating something created by others, the game designers, and making a point, and making it, uh, making it a video. And the title of this work is Miracle. Miracle because the plane doesn't crash. The miracle like Jesus Christ can walk on the water 
and 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 continue its its um, its uh, run. Now, it's not just that. Okay, it's not just appropriating a piece of a game and deciding that it's art. In the art world, meaning, relevance is constantly negotiated. And so in this case, you also had a very powerful, influent curator, Nicolas Burio, and you also had a very relevant, significant, influential art gallery in New York, the Stefano Basilico Gallery. And so you have an artist, you have a very powerful curator, you have a very powerful art gallery. You bring all these elements together, and it's 1996, it's New York, by the way, the art capital of the United States of America. And you bring this exhibition, this, all these elements in, and you create something new. All of a sudden, in 1996, people realized that video games could actually be used as a form of art, could actually say something outside of that game culture, technocentric bubble that I mentioned before. And obviously gamers were interested in this because this is not for gamers. This is for a completely different kind of milieu. And, you know, we're talking about Nicolas Burio, who, um, as I mentioned before, is one of the most influential curators, but also critics alive today, he wrote very influential books in the field of um, contemporary art and art criticism, relational aesthetics, uh, the ready kind, and post-production. Post-production was, um, a book that came out in the 90s that basically said that artists have kind of like stopped creating new art because everything has been invented and done. All they could do, all they could do was remixing, rearranging existing work. Enters multis manitas, remixing and rearranging and recontextualizing video games, fly simulators. So Perfect example of post-production among others. And so you see all the pieces of the puzzle came together. And so to me, Machinima is a form of game-based digital video art that emerged in the 90s and grew and developed independently from, from the gaming industry, independently from fandom or from the vernacular. I'm not suggesting that one is better than the other, Absolutely not. I'm suggesting there are two different things, equally fascinating, but for different reasons. And they are meant for different audiences, different contexts, and different, um, I would say, markets as well. And so Miltus Menezes was fascinated by this gaming culture and gaming aesthetics, and if Throughout the 90s and up to the early zeros, he made a series of fascinating uh, videos using video games uh, that uh, redefined the very notion of video art. So he made this very famous series called uh, Super Mario Sleeping with different variations, like he's sleeping under a painting. So you have an entire video of, they're not very long, by the way. Don't, don't, don't expect anything like um, Andy Warhol's Sleep, you know, which is like six hours long. Um, no, this is actually short videos of um, video games where nothing happens, right? It's about the moments of uh, stillness within video games because video games are, are all about uh, action and reaction and shooting and people doing things and, and they're very chaotic and loud, right? That's what we like them, right? But no, an artist brings to video games something different, a different way of looking at the game. So Manetas loved when all these characters were not doing anything. So he has an entire series about um, Super Mario Bros, the protagonist of uh, you know all the Nintendo games, doing nothing, just sleeping, just being a lazy, lazy bambino in the field, under, under a painting. Uh, this is Super Mario sleeping with butterflies. And all this work was presented at some of the most important um, blue chip galleries, museums, the ICA um, in London, the Center of Contemporary Art in Geneva, uh, everywhere, right? 
And he did all this series of like fascinating videos, right? Um, including like this one, what happens, but all the characters are looking at, around, nothing happens. They are waiting for things to happen. Nothing happens, there's no shooting. Um, they're very different from the videos that a gamer would make, right? Because gamer is about skills, it's about performance, it's about look how good I am, shooting, jumping, achieving that goal. But an artist does something completely different. An artist, for example, is fascinated by the fact that nothing is happening in the video game. And they're just like these videos of characters sitting on the stairs and just thinking and not doing anything. It's like Rodin's, you know, the thinker, right? I don't know, the reference would be completely different from um, the game iconography. And this one is, was made in 2001, it's called People Against Things, right? Presented at the Armory Show in New York, like one of the most important exhibition in the, um, uh, New York um, RC. And Miltus Marinos, what is, Miltus Marinos wasn't interested in just in um, using games to make videos and to make machinima. But as I mentioned before, his entire oeuvre is about understanding what technology does to our culture, to our life, to our everyday um, existence. And so for example, as he was bringing video games from the screens to the projector, for example, so recontextualizing them. It was also bringing like video game interfaces and tools onto the canvas. So he started paintings, for example, game controllers. He's got this entire series called Peripherals, which is fascinating. All the video game controllers, the joystick, this phallic protruding pieces of plastic with sensor in it that you use to play games. Um, cables and wires. Um, we all have, you know, like all this jungle wires, you know, all these boxes full of this stuff. And uh, Manetas was fascinating by it because it, it would say that in the past we would like paint still life, but now diseases are still life. I mean, all these gadgets and gizmos and tools that are like, like are everywhere, right? Um, Madonna with Child, look at this one. Uh, it's a PlayStation controller and Nintendo 64 controller. The Sega Dreamcast, one of my favorite console. I still use it these days to play virtual tennis because virtual tennis on the Sega Dreamcast is still the best version uh, possible. Um, these are huge paintings, by the way. They're gigantic. Uh, we showed some of them at Yale University during that game video art exhibition that I mentioned before in 2016. Uh, look at the original, the original PlayStation. Uh, cables and wires. This is another series called Point of View which once again was about bringing um, the per first person view of video games, uh, like Doom, like the subjective view as a way of looking at the world. So he made his entire series called Point of View. Again, the jungle of cables, the tools, uh, the plug, the extender cards, uh, the, the chargers, and the scene from the eye of the gamer, right? There's another one, point of view, the hands that you see when you carry a gun, for example. All you see is a gun and, and, and your hands when you play like a first person shooter, like Far Cry or um, Doom or Halo, or etc. Again, point of view. Another. And also started making, um, it was also fascinating about people playing with video games, right? Which is kind of funny, especially if you, have you ever looked at somebody playing, I don't know, a virtual reality game? They're, they look so funny. They're like ridiculous. Um, but it's just how we interact with technology today, right? And so uh, back in the 90s, he was making this gigantic paint, painting, once again, of people playing video games. So in this case, with a, a zap gun shooting on the screen, the controllers, uh, the cable. I love this stuff. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm really... Fascinating, playing you know, with a PlayStation and the gun. Childs, they're like, you know, games are a new form of literacy for the youngsters. And so playing video games, playing video games, another. Um, so the, the guy on, in the back is Mirtos Manetas himself. So my point is that Machinima as a vernacular form, as a form of user-generated production by the fans, um, kind of lost its novelty. 
and faded away from the cultural radar. Um, there was a time when, in the early years, for example, when Red versus Blue was part of the share community online. Uh, so you would have like meme and jokes about Machinima and about Red versus Blue, et cetera. But that kind of faded away, I think. Um, in fact, I don't think that many of you know the very word machinima today. It's not even used that much anymore. Um, I'm not suggesting that people don't make videos of games anymore. On the contrary, it exploded. But machinima as a cultural form belonging to the fandom has kind of disappeared. It's not disappeared, but it's definitely mm, never became mainstream um, as at one point people figured, like they thought that Machinima could become a way of doing cheap animation instead of using very powerful computers or you know the Pixar-like ultra-realistic uh, productions. But that never really happened, I would say. There are a few examples, but it's never really, never really took off. However, and this is my hypothesis, this is what I'm arguing, is that Machinima as an avant-garde, as a form of contemporary art, uh, develop in unexpected ways in different contexts that from gaming with a vastly different intents and audiences and criteria of validation and cultural relevance. And it grew and grew and grew and developed in ways that were mostly unexpected, but to me at least very fascinating. And so I already mentioned Meltus Manetas and there are other artists that um, back in the zeros, invented almost a brand new film from scratch. And some of these uh, pioneers are, I apologize for only showing white dudes, um, all male by the way, but I have, there's more to it. So I'm not suggesting the machine is, is necessarily only a male um, um, pursuit, a male activity on the contrary, uh, but, Inequitably, in in um, some of the most relevant artists working in this field, especially back in the day, were all male dudes. Biltus Manetas, Brody Condon, Corey Kangel, John Rathman. Okay, so Brody Condon um, lived in California, still lives in California and uh, work among others with uh, Edo Stern. They did a lot of interesting work uh, back in the day. Um, he started doing really interesting stuff with, uh, with uh, video games at the end of the 90s. It was among the first to use modding in a very creative way. Um, so uh, tempering and tinkering with the, um, the code of the game to create interesting uh, outcomes. Uh, Adam Keller, very controversial work of this. Uh, it's basically done by appropriating an existing video game once again, F Live, do, and um, just um, uh, creating endless copies of his assistant or friend, I can't remember, and shoot it in an incredibly violent way. Um, and using glitch as an aesthetic kind of um, currency. He also did a lot of work with The Sims, again, using glitches and bugs to do some creative stuff, uh, like this, for example. I apologize for the poor quality of the image. Couldn't find anything better. This is very early work, by the way. Um, it's only 20 years, but it's already kind of uh, dated. Um, another of my favorite works of uh, condoms is uh, Suicide Solution that he made in 2004. And it's, about, it's a video where he just kill himself. He's using like different video games and killing himself over and over again. Um, and now you have entire like super cuts of this, right? You know, where people the people do like, you know, weird stuff with games. But back in the day it was uh, again, like a, an artistic pursuit, you know, having a character killing himself 50 different times from um, sh first person shooter, third person shooter, and making that as a statement about game culture and, and uh, contemporary aesthetics, the aesthetics of the suicide. Um, this one, very interesting when he replaced the character from uh, Half Life 2 with uh, Elvis Presley, um, sorry, Unreal, uh, not, uh, not Half Life 2. So you also use Unreal. 
Um, and this work was even uh, mentioned on the cover of a very important American magazine of art. Again, not a game magazine, but Art News, which like Flash Art or our forum is uh, about contemporary art. And this article was about how video games became art. And they became art because of people like Brody Condon, uh, Miltus Manetas, and um, Cora Kendrell, and many more. And this idea of using game aesthetics and game logic to make art um, transcend machinima itself. So another, um, uh, another work of uh, Brody Condon that I really, really love is Death Animation that he made between 2007 and 2008. This is the installation view. I mean, this, the performance space at Machine Project in uh, Los Angeles, which was uh, an independent gallery. And it's basically having like real people wearing a uh, fantasy armor recreated from uh, fantasy video games. And they would recreate in slow motion death animation. You know, when you kill somebody in a video game, somebody dies and eventually disappears from the screen. They would do this kind of like slow movement for hours. Uh, and it was basically bringing the aesthetics of the video game within um, physical spaces like that. Uh, which I always thought fascinating. There's, for example, other artists that do the same. Um, Aaron Bartol, German artist, genius. Um, um, but this is Brody Condon. And he also recreated within using Unreal and other uh, video game tools, famous paintings from, uh, from the past. Uh, and so the idea was to sort of like use uh, the framing of video games to um, recontextualize um, classical art. There's a few examples. Um, Corey Kenji is probably the most famous, has been called the Andy Warhol of the 21st century by um, The New Yorker in 2002 in a very famous profile. He lives in Brooklyn. Um, he did a lot of work that uh, can be considered a form of machinima, uh, like nap time in 2002, uh, where he would basically hack uh, Nintendo games, Nintendo cartridges, and make films, make videos with that game uh, specifically. Uh, Super Mario movie uh, is probably the most famous one. It's a, like a 20 minute movie uh, which shows Mario going incre increasingly deranged into the space of Super Mario Bros. Uh, it becomes very, very abstract and cacophonic and it's a fascinating work. Um, this is probably his most famous work. It's called Super Mario Clouds. And it's about Super Mario Bros. Um, without all the other elements of the game, removing the characters, removing um, the props, and just leaving out the clouds. And the clouds are scrolling, but everything else has been eliminated by a process of uh, subtraction. Uh, Super Mario movie I mentioned before. F2, another example where it would take a very famous uh, racing game and eliminate everything, including the cars. So the game-like element and just have this image scrolling continuously, monochromatic also, tinkering and altering the colors. And Corey Kinjo is a, is a fascinating artist because um, he also shares uh, the code. So his entire artwork is available online uh, this is how this website looks like, for example, on Super Mario Movie, for example, it's a modded, uh, change altered Super Mario Brothers cartridge that he made with Paper Red um, in 2005. It's a 15 minute movie. And again, as you can see at the bottom, uh, the code is available at the bottom. You can download the 15 kilobyte file. Uh, fascinating, fascinating. Um, Super Mario Clouds install usually like this in galleries, and it's a very peaceful, serene work, very different from the original Nintendo game, right? But once again, this is appropriate material from, um, from an existing game. Uh, here's another example. Here's another example. It's how it's installed in a Migros Museum in, um, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, other works that he does also with other games like MiG-29 and Clouds, just to pose as video installations is our basil in 2017, another way of displaying that kind of work. This uh, Super Mario movie presented uh, Ditch Projects in uh, New York in 2005. Once again, this is the artwork itself, the modded cartridge, the broken, it goes into the game, it breaks it. 
So there's a difference, right, between what Miltus Manetes did, which was just recontextualizing existing images. In this case, you break into the game itself. You alter the code. This requires also a kind of technical skills that are not necessarily widespread or common by any means. Um, here's the installation of the work. So within the art gallery becomes some kind of an arcade, some kind of a, an artistic space where he does uh, his thing. And the there's you know glitch aesthetics, the 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 data progressively becoming more and more corrupted until the entire world collapses or actually implodes and, and everything is lost. It's also about bringing the code to the surface. Games are all about creating this ultra realistic images and super detailed worlds. But artists do exactly the opposite. They break them. They show out what's underneath the hood, right? Um, another work of his that I, that I really love is um, this self-plane uh, bowling machines. So it took like 16, I think it was 16 different um, bowling games from the Nintendo, from the Atari 2600 to the PlayStation. And he hacks them once again. So the machine plays by itself, right? And all, and all you see on the screen projected is the machine play, playing bowling by itself and losing every single time. And it's, you know, this is the space. Once again, you can see on the table, all the consoles or the games and projected. You can see how they are displayed for, for, the, for the viewers. Um, the same exhibition, Pro Tools, was restaged in the UK uh, at the Barbican Center. And once again, you can see these rows of consoles. They're broken. He breaks them deliberately to show this um, self-playing bully machines. They don't even require a player anymore, right? It's, they're just playing by themselves. And you walk through this entire space. It's just, uh, it's, it's really fascinating. fascinating. You can see a detail of the hacked controller. So you see, this is this is not easy. This is not just recontextualizing the work. It's really doing things with games that you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to break the game and have this kind of outcomes. But that's that's how gamers, sorry, that's how artists play with games, with video games. It's a different kind of gameplay, as you can tell. And so last but not least, um, John Rathman. Okay, he's Canadian. He was born in 1981. Um, here's uh, his self-portrait. And John Rothman is very fascinating because he's been doing machinima for uh, many, many years. And uh, uh, his machinima are incredibly elaborate. Sometimes they use it multiple games. Um, this one was in Second Life, for example. It's called Code of Honors. Uh, it's the story of a um, player that used to be a champion of arcade games. Um, this is like a 15 minute uh, video that he made almost 10 years ago. But he would also take games like Max Payne 3, for example, and make an entire movie based on the theme of uh, memory. And, and usually he recites, it's is, is like, is like a voiceover over images and telling a story that is completely or not, you don't know, unrelated from the original game. is a very unreliable narrator. And it's a very interesting way of creating a story within the game space that is nothing that has nothing to do with the original video game, which is basically a revenge story, right? Or in this case, remember Carthage, uh, it takes um, Uncharted and Second Life to create a story to create a new narrative about travel, about memories, uh, about the boundary between reality and simulation. And um, I particularly love how John Raffman uh, presents and displays his work everywhere. So he creates like very weird installations where uh, uh, the viewers have to sit on uh, weird concoctions like this. So it's not just by showing stuff on a screen. It's really about in, inhabiting the work of art and wearing like weird um, displays or head-mounted uh, uh, displays, etc. 
Uh, look at this installation. I mean, this is kind of like terrifying. Look at this kind of like David Cronenberg like existent like um, uh, organic uh, body horror uh, seats where you see and you watch these videos machinima made with like game engines like Unity or Unreal. Most of the cases, look at this. Uh, a three screen installation. Okay, this is fantastic. So, for example, I mentioned a man digging, which was the 2013 machinima that he did with Max Payne. And if you want to watch that machinima, you basically have to open this um, a piece of furniture, this archive file kind of set of drawers. It's actually pretty big. And then you enter and you sit down and you watch the machinima. I think this is brilliant. So you see how this is in a, a completely different ways of playing video games than gamers than people traditionally play with games. And it's creating something else that is uh, truly fascinating. Once again, John Ruffin doesn't ask the permission to use Max Payne 3, he just, he just does it. He appropriates it and he creates a work of art. Um, here's another installation. There was This was in a show in um, New York. Um, I think it was 10 years ago, I can't remember, but uh, Codes of Honor is playing on the screen and everything else is kind of like, Make it made, made to look like um, uh, rock, like granite, like uh, asphalt, like concrete. Fascinating. So to simplify and to summarize, it, it seems to me that there are two kinds of, uh, of actors here. There are gamers that play games. We all play games um, on our screens or our consoles, PCs, et cetera. But then there are artists that play with games, right? They don't play like everybody else. Sometimes they play against games. They break them, they ruin them to make something completely different. Um, so at Yulm, for example, we're interested in both. We are interested in having our student making and creating games through game design, but also encourage this kind of artistic engagement with games. And so breaking games and doing things that are very very far from games, like machinima, right? And so people who now make machinima seems to be that are basically pursuing four different kinds of goals. Um, one is to rec to make a record, to make a document, to document their performance within the video game. Because playing video games is so ephemeral, right? You play a game, the game is gone forever. But you make a video for the same reason why you take a photograph, you know, to, to, to preserve something from oblivion, to have a memory, a, a souvenir, a memento, right? And now you make a video, you make a machinima. And you might share that or not, it's just for you. Machine is also used also for Documenting and highlighting glitches in video games, which is you know those malfunctions that create the game that 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 cause the game to break, to implode, to collapse, and they're funky, right? And they're funny because games are not supposed to break, but especially when games are first released, they have some funny, funny, funny bugs sometimes. I remember especially a, an, an episode of Assassin's Creed which came out, which is just hysterical. People getting stuck in roof and. Uh, uh, I don't know, merging with the uh, horses or something. And there was an, or Tony Hawk, you know, the the skateboarding game, which uh, everybody played just because it was so broken and they could make all these funky videos and it was hysterical. Um, or you break a game on purpose like Core Angel does and then you make a video documentation of that. And there's uh, Machinima as assemblage, which is another art, uh, world term that is about basically mixing together different sources. And so you would have machinima made with video game footage, but also other kind of footage, like, I don't know, live footage or other images or photographs or animations, right? And you create this very complex kind of uh, films that are in between, the, like mixed media, different kind of uh, work. And this is another genre that is very popular with machinima within the artistic um, sphere. And then there's the, the notion of the frame, right? Uh, because the frame, right? Right now you see me in a, on, a, on a rectangle, right? We're mediated more and more, especially during the pandemic by the screens. And the screens are like windows 
but they're also like uh, the frame of the painting, right? We see images um, on our like cellular phones. It's, it's all like frames, right? And so increasingly our lives are mediated by these frames, by these windows, by these screens. And machinima is very fascinating to me because it is something that is born on small screens, usually monitors, computer monitors, or even TV screens, right? But um, we like to project these images and to have them like bigger than life and present them, for example, in a, in, in, in a cinema context, right? The projection, the movie screen, because it's so wrong, because they're not, you're not supposed to watch a machinima on a 500 inch you know, screen. But when you do that, when you decontextualize the game image, it becomes, you know, to me at least, uh, more even more fascinating than just watching on a regular screen or a video installation. And so what I, I tried to discuss today was really this notion of uh, um, game videos as a, an expression of contemporary art. There's an entire field, which is also live streaming, which um, I'm not gonna talk, I'm not, I'm not gonna discuss today because it would require too much time, uh, perhaps in another episode. But I wanted to emphasize Machinima because this is exactly what um, our students do. Uh, they learn how to do that because you learn how to, for example, edit. And there's so much in it because there's a language of cinema, there's a language of video games, there's a language of contemporary art, there's a language of video art all combined to make these kinds of production. And as I mentioned before, machinima is also a, a democratic form of, um, of making, um, making video, making films. Um, because unlike game culture, which is still strictly kind of defined or in terms of gender, um, there's, a, there's still a divide between, for example, our core gamers that play first-person shooters, for example, a sports game, and um, female players that play, I don't know, this, you know the, the so-called casual games, right? But when it comes to machinima, and I apologize if I gave you the wrong impression, it's mostly a male thing. Women artists are doing incredible, cutting-edge, fascinating work, and they have been doing since day one. Um, these are just some of the artists that I love, like um, Jackie Connolly, she's American. She makes these like one hour machinima that are just fascinating. Um, very David Lynch-like, very, very, and we show a few of them during the Machinima Film Festival in Milan in the past few years. They're just like incredible. The, the latest one, Anedonia, um, mixes live footage with uh, footage from The Sims. Very cutting edge, very original. Uh, Georgia Roxby Smith, she is, uh, is a, um, an Australian artist, and she uses, for example, Grand Theft Auto V to talk about gender, stereotyping, and there's a work that we presented uh, at that previous exhibition in 2016, but she's, she's this very prolific, very cutting edge, very original. Uh, Leta Shirin, and she, she's another um, fascinating artist, who uses, um, in this case, The Sims to make her videos and installations. Um, Kara Gutt, um, she uses a variety of games, including Skyrim, for example, to make these videos. She made this entire series of mods called Intimacy, which is about the depiction of, uh, for example, queer sex and within fantasy games. Um, a fascinating, fascinating project. Um, Elaine Hui, uh, she also used video games to depict, for example, the poses of um, Call of Duty characters within the game, within the kind of like a male um, space within game culture and presenting the avatars as culture. And so she eliminates all the kind of like details, the textures, and she makes them look like sculptures, like modern sculptures. But she uses Call of Duty as a point of reference. If you're interested in knowing more about this, there's an entire field um, of studies called Machinima Studies. And these are some of the books that um, describe this phenomenon. Uh, we also have a book series about Machinima um, in English and Italian. Uh, and we're encouraging like young artists and, and authors to write uh, and to participate 
Uh, we also have like all four papers. Um, the one in the middle, the vernacular machine was written by a current PhD student at Yale University. And the other one, Machine of State of the Art is a edited collection of essays in English that will be released in early 2021, uh, where we engage with the artists. Um, another thing that I wanted to tell you before I let you go is uh, another initiative, another project that we launched in 2020. So uh, in 2020, as you know, the pandemic um, uh, exploded pretty much everywhere on the world. And around March, we were supposed to have the third edition of the Milan Film Festival, which it's an annual event where we present the very best of machinima to our viewers. But we couldn't, we couldn't because obviously everything was, uh, uh, we were like sheltering in, in place and there was a major lockdown. And so we launched an alternative platform. We also had an online version of the Machine Film Festival, but we thought instead of having Machine just for, you know, an annual event, why don't we have Machine all the time? And so we launched this online platform called Viral. Um, I want to say we also mean um, former PhD students or uh, former students that graduate in game design, like Gemma Fantacci uh, or Luca Miranda, who's an artist also here in Milan. And um, and they they curate. We curate programs. We have two shows per uh, per month, and we invite artists to showcase their work, and we, we interview them, and we collect that interview uh, for um, publications. And uh, once again, we want to show how uh, diverse Machinima is today. What you can do with video games that is not that is not just necessarily playing. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with playing per se, but this is another form of play. And so there are artists like um, Victor Morales, who was born in uh, Venezuela and now lives in New York, um, who uh, uses. Uh, uh, the Unreal Engine to do this and virtual reality to do this incredible narrative, narratives. And he also go, he also has like uh, theater performances. So again, recontextualizing video games within the, the theater space, I find it very, very interesting. So we debuted with uh, Rapid Transit pre, uh, preface, which is uh, kind of like a prelude of a larger project. Um, but you know, Machinima is international, speaks all the different languages. We had artists from Germany, from Austria, uh, Alexander Radan, for example, um, using Grand Theft Auto V to do this kind of like uh, weird, deranged, surreal narratives. We had uh, Jordi Venstra, he's from the Netherlands and he's an incredibly, incredibly talented filmmaker and graphic designers and Machinima maker. And he uses a variety of games. Uh, he has this series with Quake, by the way. He kind of like updated the Quake movies for the 21st century. But I'm personally in love with this series called Regression, uh, which is like Goffrey Recho's Koyanis Katsis rethought and, and reinterpreted through um, Grand Theft Auto V. And it's really about the space. There are no real characters, there's no the story. It's more like a, a visual, um, unbelievable, uh, immersive, engaging uh, description of Los Santos and San Andreas, which is a virtual uh, state where Grand Theft Auto V takes place, as you know. Uh, Petra Zatzman, uh, Zeman, sorry, Petra Zeman, who lives in Japan. Uh, and uh, she's making this incredible series called Monomyth, uh, which is really about creating an avatar and telling your story as an avatar to talk about the problem of mediation I was talking to you before and the idea of role play. And so she, she, she's, she inhabits the space of Japan, but also Skyrim, which is her favorite game. And for her, they're both the same, right? And she makes all these like short videos trying to make sense of life in the 21st century with all this frame, with all the screens, with all these narratives. And so I love this series. It's so I find it so brilliant. Um, Thomas Aranke is from Germany. He uh, creates incredible machinima, for example, by even like translating machinima through 
video, from video to analog, and he uses these weird machines to recontextualize the very medium, the materiality of something that is intangible, usually, like machine is all video, right? But he, he uses like film as well. And this was an incredible, um, it's also very interesting in the representation of animals within um, video game spaces, like Grand Theft Auto V or Far Cry. Um, so this, uh, this is a, uh, this project Shadows Ultra, it's about the shadows of animals, probably like chickens or birds within Far Cry 5. I mean, this, you see how, if you're really into it, the kind of like layers of meaning that you can build upon an image, a video game image. Another favorite of mine, Brenton Alexander Smith from Australia. And it uses a game engine to create these weird scenarios where you have like weird um, caralized sculptures, kind of like, like John Chamberlain, but within video game spaces or digital spaces. And they kind of like move like this. They seem alive, it's very organic. They fall apart, they implode. Um, and these videos have no real narrative. They're more about like mood and feeling. And, um, and once again, it shows you how you can use game-like assets to create your own aesthetics, your own world. Um, others like um, John B.R.K. Magnusson is from uh, Sweden and he made this incredible documentary about EVE Online. And the documentary is done within EVE Online. So use a video game to make a documentary about a video game. And it's uh, basically, it, it started doing this as a, as a, as a final project for his, for his um, ethnography, digital ethnography class. And it became an incredible film that we showed not too long ago and it won a lot of prizes. And it's really about understanding the EVE Online community, which is an incredible multiplayer game that takes place in space. And there are all these allegiances and, and, and clans. Um, David Blendy, uh, another incredibly uh, clever artist and creative from um, the United Kingdom. And during the pandemic, he made this work called How to Fly. And it's an example of desktop cinema where you basically record your entire, cin your entire desktop, for example, with um, OBS or other tools. And um, the entire video is basically like a tutorial on how to fly and he uses um, a bird from um, Grand Theft Auto V. And he, it's a very sort of like quiet and tranquil and peaceful video about flying in an otherwise ultra violent and brutal game like Grand Theft Auto V. And we show that uh, recently. Um, and uh, it's part of an ongoing series, the how to series. Brent Watan so Brent Watanabe is a. Uh, an American artist who lives in uh, Seattle, and he made an incredible machinima with Animal Crossing New Horizons, which as you know, if you're a gamer, was the most popular video game during the pandemic. Everybody was on, was playing this game and was visiting friends' islands, right? I'm sure you, if you love this game, if you love Nintendo, if you have a Switch, you probably did as well. And he did an entire project with Animal Crossing, which was really about consumption, speaking of consumption. And he made an island where he was hoarding all this material, all these goods, all these toys, all these gizmos, all these gadgets, until he couldn't really literally walk. Um, and it's really about a uh, commentary on consumption, production, capitalism. Uh, so you can, as you can see, you can use any kind of games to make a machinima. You, you don't have to rely necessarily just on first-person shooters or um, Grand Theft Auto V, right? You can pretty much do anything you want. Um, there's a lot of uh, machinima done with uh, Minecraft, for example, or other games. Um, Edwin Lowe from Hong Kong, for example, um, used, used Outlast to make his machinima. And it's uh, very interesting because it's, um, it's about very heavy themes like of death and, and cru crucifixion and resurrection. And as then there's another example of um, desktop cinema, uh, desktop documentary, he filmed the entire process of making this machinima and just assembling different uh, sources, the video game, 
Google search, um, YouTube. And before, when I mentioned that Machinima has a strong assemblage uh, nature or tendency, this is what I meant. You mix together, you combine different video sources to create something new, something else. Uh, Fantastic Little Splash is a couple of artists, incredible art collective from Dinpro, Ukraine. And they work with uh, video games, uh, but mostly like game uh, engines. Um, incredible. They're, very, they're, they're phenomenal. And they did an entire project within VR chat, which is a virtual reality chat, as the name says, that is growing. It's becoming like the new second life, I would say, these days. And they made this video called uh, Forward, Upward in All Directions, which was just like, like phenomenal. It was funny. It was uh, surreal, it was unsettling. And again, it's like documenting what's happening in, in these spaces, right? Uh, what do people do? Uh, how do they interact in these places with virtual reality displays? And this um, machine, this 20, 15 minutes machine was very interesting as a, as a, as a documentary basically on what happens. Um, this is the penultimate show that we presented at Viral, and it's by um, Mikhail uh, Maximov, a Russian uh, artist that makes video games as his main medium, okay? So for him, artistic video games are its me his medium of choice, like a painter who uses paint, a filmmaker who uses a camera to make films, but, and he makes games. And this game is called Infinite Graveyard. What is it? It's a, it's a simulator of graveyards, okay? It's a cemetery simulator manager, kinda. And the video that he showed was 666 minute long. And it's basically let's play, kind of like a let's play of his game that you can buy for $666 from Ichio. And, uh, we released that be between Halloween, as you can, you know, on the day before Halloween, basically, um, because it was very, you know, like um, uh, related to the notion of uh, cemeteries and death. Also, the pandemic is not exactly a happy, happy time. So we try to exercise this by showing a, a maximum of a genius project. And currently, if you log on to viral.org, V-R-A-L dot uh, O-R-G, you can see uh, Chitimaris by Luca Miranda, who was, by the way, a former student at Yulm and now is making machinima, is making uh, video game art. Uh, he's also writing a book about walking simulators and is um, a very talented uh, machinima maker. And uh, this work is all about, in this case, using a cheat mode rather than a mod. So instead of tinkering with the code, it's really about using existing like information to alter the presentation of the game to make a point in this case about consumerism, waste, luxury, status, reputation. Um, yeah. So um, if you're interested in this um, topic, uh, and if you make if you make machine by yourself, which I, I hope you do, um, there's a call for um, uh, machinima. The deadline is December 15, 2020, and uh, we'll be having our annual uh, Machinima Festival. Even if the pandemic is still with us, we'll do it online. We, the the, the COVID-19 is not going to stop us. You can't stop Machinima. And so if you log on to milanmachinimafestival.org, you can find all information and um, about viral and about uh, the festival itself. So I hope that... Uh, some of you will actually consider participating and 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 um, and uh, start making films and videos with machinima, with video games, right? In order to do machinima, because this is a completely different way of playing games, uh, no less creative, no less satisfying. And so, um, yeah, if you're interested, I can provide additional information or uh, I can respond to questions if you have any. So, thank you very much, Pastor Kupati, from your beautiful presentation. Honestly, on a personal note, I have to say that I was 
lost myself in the slideshow because I realized that there is a complete new world that I wasn't aware of because I, at the beginning of this masterclass, I was, I thought I was keen on machinima and game videos, but then I realized that there is a huge world related to contemporary art and, and pieces of art that I wasn't aware of. So thank you for this because it was amazing, really, really amazing. Um, thank you. If you don't mind, I I selected just a couple of questions from from the audience for this masterclass. So while you were you were speaking, we had questions coming in from the YouTube channel, and I selected a, a couple of them for you. First question from the audience is: What if a machinima introduces introduce some kind of interaction with the audience at a certain level so would that be considered machinima or something something else that is such a great question i love it i love it um in fact there is also interactive machinima although it never really took off but as a form of it's it's a form of, of, of experimenting with media i love that because you're you're this is such a great question because Machinima is about taking away interactivity, right? To make a film. But then you bring interactivity back um, to create some kind of like a game-like experiment, right? So it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, Bandersnatch, you know, Black Mirror Bandersnatch, where you have, you know, different kind of paths that you can select. Uh, um, one of the problems is that it's a lot of work as you know. So if you make a, that kind of machinima, you have to film twice as much content because you have to create all these branching narratives and then you have to put all them together. Um, but there are people who do that actually. And um, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. So that's why you don't see many interactive machinima, but it does exist. Right. Thank you. Um, Another question that we have is um, more related to um, machinima and its potential applications in, in the real world. So, um, for example, I, I am now referring to, well, we all know about in-game advertising. For example, we have a large number of examples like in-game advertising, for example, in Grand Theft Auto you quoted during the masterclass. Um, recently, one of the most famous and well-known titles is probably the 2K series for those who are really interested in sports. For example, NBA 2K, they've made a lot of progress with in-game advertising. But what if it was the other way around? So what if actually brands used machinimas with official characters from game franchises to do advertising for mass production on TV for everybody. I just, for example, I was just thinking of, I don't know, maybe Tommy Versetti from Grand Theft Auto by City doing an advertisement for sports cars. Would that be possible? Would that work? Here. Well, that's a fascinating question. I think it would be possible. You need to coordinate with the publisher, obviously, and the brand, but you can certainly do that. Um, I don't think you would necessarily need machinima. You would just have, you know, you would just use the assets and the characters. Uh, you can certainly do that. So I like the idea. When, all these questions are about like, like subverting the narrative, right? Like bringing the interactivity back. In this case, bringing like the game out of the game to do advertising, fascinating. Yeah, I guess you technically could do it. Um, in fact, I didn't mention it during the presentation, but there are so many other ways of using machinima outside of art. So for example, uh, machinima is used for education. Um, there's a one of the latest um, Assassin's Creed games, um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, for example. Odyssey mm -hmm. has a very powerful um, discovery tool, which is really about learning about the past through the video game. 
and it's a it's like you it's a tour like you you it's an interactive kind of um exploration of ancient egypt or greece or etc and you interact with the characters There's no game like you have no goals or objective but you can make a video and you can use it use it as a tool to teach um ancient history in a much more dynamic and engaging way than just reading um a book or uh, watching a film even, right? So it's the idea that uh, you become the explorer, you're engaged and you use video game elements to basically make teaching and education much more immersive, compelling and engaging, right? Um, and this is just an example. So you can certainly do that for teaching, for advertising. Another example that I can think of recently, um, a playwright used The Sims 4 to reenact End of Chekhov's The Seagull, which is a play. So all the theaters were closed because of the pandemic. So all these actors didn't know what to do. So she did a two hour stream on Twitch using the Sims to recreate the play. Okay, it's just genius. Genius because you use like, you merge together video games, theater, uh, a share collect and people were watching and commenting in real time. So it was about recreating the, the the theater experience within Twitch online. And last but not least, you talk about advertising. Dude, what about politics? Video games have been used for politics more and more. Two examples and then I'll stop. But Joe Biden built an entire island within Animal Crossing. And that was their platform within the game and people could visit him and listen to the policies and just look at all the paraphernalia so it's about using video games to discuss politics as well now nintendo kind of like trying to it's trying to ban that they don't like their games to be used for poli political reasons also um you know for revenge you know you, you can imagine like the you don't want to bring this information and kind of like friction within video games as well um but this is an example. Another example, which is doing a political campaign through a video game recently, the Democrat candidate Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did a hugely powerful and popular stream, live streaming session of Among Us, which is a very popular game on Twitch. And she's a great gamer. She's fantastic. She's very young and very, very cool and very hip. And she played for like hours and half a million people watch her play live on Twitch. And she also like reminded people to go vote for the presidential election. But what I'm trying to say is that you can see that video games can be used for so many uses outside of just like entertainment and fun. They can be using for communication, politics, learning, art. And this is just some of the things, for example, that we try to do here at Yulm, using the, the game, not just at, as an end in itself, but as a means to do other things. That is absolutely fascinating. Actually, I wasn't aware of um, Senator Cortez doing a live stream with half a million viewers at the same time. That is amazing, really amazing. That's incredible. Well, thank you very much for answering the questions. We, we've just selected a couple of questions from the audience because questions were came in during the live stream but unfortunately, I'm not sure we have the time to answer all the questions from the audience. Um, of course, in case you're interested in uh, the topic of today's masterclass, you can also contact our university and we will be very happy to answer all your questions and to uh, provide more and more content. Also, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this masterclass that the whole webinar is being recorded, so it, it will be available on our official YouTube channel from tomorrow onwards. So if you want to rewatch this masterclass or share the link with your peers, you are absolutely free to do that. So thank you very much, Professor Vitanti. It was my pleasure to have you here this afternoon. Really, really enjoyed this brilliant, astonishing, I have to say, masterclass. Thank you for your contribution. And with your permission, I would like to give 
a few more extra information to our audience today on how to become part of IULM University community and how to become a student at our university. So I'm going to share the screen now and I will show you a couple of slides. should be seeing the screen right now. So I just want to, like I said, I just want to give you a few couple of pieces of information for you to know how to become part of our community, how to become a student at our university. And hopefully you enjoy the content of this masterclass. So maybe you want to know more about our university and how to become student in our bachelor program in corporate communication and public relations, just to mention. So our university was founded in 1968. It has nearly 7,000 students and with a very good students to teaching staff ratio and 20% of international students when it comes to degree courses held in English. We are a very American style campus with seven buildings and 50,000 square meters campus with one dedicated subway station just outside the main gate of the university. As I've told you before, this masterclass series is meant to give you a sneak peek on what it's like to be enrolled in our bachelor program of corporate communication and public relations. As you can see on screen, CCPR, as we love to call it, is our bachelor program entirely taught in English, together with other six courses at undergraduate level, which are taught in Italian language. We are very good in interpreting our languages. So we have a bachelor program in interpreting and communication, a bachelor in communication media and advertising, a three year bachelor in corporate communication and public relations in Italian, which is the original one. And I will tell you more in the following slide. Tourism, management and culture, another highlight of our university arts, media, and cultural events, and the latest edition, fashion and creative industries. Our bachelor program, CCPR, was, as a matter of fact, the first course on public relations to be ever established in Italy. And it was also the first one to have an English curriculum. So, a version of the course entirely taught in English. By the way, it is also nowadays one of the, uh, if not the most important and the most prestigious bachelor in corporate communication in Italy. It's a three year course, so 180 ECTS. Some data about this beautiful course. As you can see, we have a perfect balance. 50% of the teaching staff for this course come from the, the job market, so the outer world. They are professionals. They are successful professionals, CEOs, CFOs. The other 50% is made of top-level academics. We have a state-of-the-art study plan always renovating itself. So our course is able to change its contents and its modules according to the needs of the job market every year. We organize, we regularly organize workshops with partner companies and institutional meetings with the VIPs. And most importantly, perhaps this is the highlight, 65% of graduates from CCPR are able to find a job within one year of graduation. 
what gives you in practice, what is able to give you this bachelor's degree? A solid preparation on economics and management. You will be able to evaluate with success the impact of media on social and cultural systems. And so you will gain highly specialized knowledge on communication procedures. You will become a communication guru. You will become a social media manager. You will become an official spokesperson for a multinational company. You will have an enhancement of personal skills and motivation. This is what corporate communication and public relations is all about. At graduate level, so the two years master's degrees, we have a natural continuation of our undergraduate courses. So for those courses held in Italian language, we offer a two-year master in specialized translation and conference interpreting. Then we have a master in television, cinema and new media. A master in marketing, consumption and communication and a master in art, valorization and market. But the highlight at graduate level is without any doubt our academic offer taught in English. We have two master's degrees, strategic communication and hospitality and tourism management. Both of them are double degrees. It is interesting to notice that, for example, the two-year program in hospitality and tourism management is offered in cooperation with the University of Central Florida in the U.S. And then we have a large number of one-year master programs. A number of them are also taught in English, as you can see on screen. Some of them are executive, so intended for students who already run a business, so they're more like businessmen or businesswomen than students. And in the list, of course, we have the one-year master program in game design, of which Professor Vitanti is coordinating. A couple of words about admission requirements to IULM. For the two-year bachelor's degree, you need to have a high school diploma for your, from the whole country with at least 12 years of schooling and certificate of English language proficiency, B2 level. However, if you don't have any certificate, you don't need to worry because you can also take an assessment test directly at IUL University, also from distance, given the pandemic and the new travel restrictions that we have at present. As you can see, the whole application process is very smooth bureaucracy is cut to the minimum. So the two-year master's degree is pretty much the same. The only difference is that you will be running an interview with the director of your master's degree and you will need to show good knowledge to the topics related to your chosen program. So you need to have a bachelor's degree in a relevant field and a strong motivation. As far as tuition fees are concerned, the three-year undergraduate programs are for 8,400 per year, divided into three installments, and the two-year postgraduate programs require 9,800 per year, also divided into three installments. We offer a wide range of financial aids opportunities for talented international students. For example, just to give you a hint, a 50% tuition fee reduction in the first year of tuition fee based on merit. So this was just a brief overview of our academic offer and our admission requirements and tuition fees for you to have a complete picture of how it is like to become a student at IULM University. Of course, if you have any kinds of questions, 
both related to today's masterclass or even related to uh, the content of my slideshow and the admission process to IOLM, you can contact us anytime at admission at IULM.it and please visit our official website www.iulm.com. You can also use this number on screen, which is a WhatsApp business number for direct inquiries to the university. So, I believe this is the end of today's masterclass. Again, I thank you very much, all of you, all members of the audience, for joining us today. It has been a pleasure and an honor to play as the host for you and to have Professor Vitanti talking with us today about this fascinating topic of game videos. So the transition from video games to cinema and game videos. Stay tuned with our upcoming international events because IULM flow continues and we will have further webinars and we will keep you posted. So thank you very much again and enjoy the rest of the week and your weekend. Thank you.